So in 1914, there was a a famous painting that was uh, hanging up in the Royal Academy in London, England. And Sigmund Freud saw this painting hanging there, and he would later write about this. But uh, this painting, and this is a picture of it right here, it depicted this policeman holding back traffic in London. Keep in mind, it was 1914. And so the carriages, the horses, he's, he's holding them all back. And walking right through in that busy city street there is this nanny with this child, and the child's dressed all up, the nanny has these toys, and there was kind of an inscription that was under the painting that said, the world must stop so the child may pass. And then the painting had this title, His Majesty the Baby. His Majesty the Baby. There is some truth in the fact that when we come into this world, it is kind of like we're royalty, isn't it? It's like we got our own little kingdom. And we have our own little bed, our own little room, our own little blanket. And there's these older adults that wait on us hand and foot. If we're hungry, we just, and here they are with food. Uh, When we don't like it, we just spit it out. And then they're right there to clean up our little mouth. When we're dirty, they come and they change us. We We just let out a cry. They're right there at moment's notice, ready to help, serve. We have our own little kingdom, right? His royal majesty, the baby. And then there comes that day when your kingdom is turned upside down because you are walking to do something and all of a sudden you hear words you've never heard before in your kingdom and it is the word no. And you will fight that and you will resist that. You don't like those words. And then it gets worse because there will come a day when someone will hand you a spoon and they will say, feed yourself. And then there comes that day when they hand you a bill and say, pay it yourself. This is called a job. Earn your own money. And all of a sudden, things begin to change. And, 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 and if we don't learn this, if we don't understand that we have to mature, we have to grow up, we have to become unselfish, if we don't do that, then we're going to find ourselves stuck in immaturity. And that's a problem because on your first birthday, when you're a little high chair and you got your cake and they're smashing all that all over their face and you see pictures of it all over Facebook, everyone's like, oh, he's so cute. Oh, it's so sweet. It's not so cute when you're 18. No pictures of that on Facebook when you're 18 going on. You know, you you see a child sitting in their mom's lap being cuddled and held and oh, it's so sweet. Not so sweet when you're 25. Let her have the seat and you sit on the floor. That's how it works when you're 25 because you're supposed to be growing up. And as a young child, you know, to be cared for, and I mean, that, that is honorable. To, to, to be loved is essential. We, we need that foundation of safety and security and love, and it is appropriate. Uh, an infant needs to be cared for. I think it's honorable to have a policeman holding up traffic so that a child and, and his caregiver can, can go through the streets safely. That is an honorable thing to do. We, we should do that. But if we don't learn to be unselfish, if we don't learn to delay gratification, we begin to buy into this lie that we start to buy into pretty early in life, which is it's all about you. It is all about you. And that's a pretty easy lie to buy into. I mean, even as adults, even now, when we realize, you know, it's really not all about us and we should be unselfish and and, and we should be uh, generous and things like that. Even now, marketers, they, they appeal to that side of our nature that's selfish. That marketers do that when it's promoting product and promoting goods. They'll start talking about how you deserve this and you've earned this and have it your way and the focus is on you, which is why when Rick Warren wrote his book, this bestseller called Purpose Driven Life, and the first line in it was, it's not about you. It was like everybody was like, <gasps> smack in the face and started buying millions of copies because they just hadn't heard that in a while. It's not about you. In fact, uh, I want us to look today, if you have a Bible or device, I want you to go to Luke chapter 12. And in Luke chapter 12, uh, which we introduced last week as we began this short series we're doing called Money Talks. We introduced last week, we, we opened up to Luke 12 because here in this text, Uh, Jesus tells us about a rich man who experienced an incredible windfall. I mean, success fell into his lap. He had a harvest that was unheard of. The word for good crop there was euphoric. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable. And lastly, we talked about the fact that the problem for this rich man was the fact that he left God out of his decision making. And and not only did he leave God out of his decisions in regard to money, but he did not acknowledge God as his source of wealth and 
He also didn't trust God. He trusted in what he had instead of who provided it. And, and so as we kind of let that unfold through this story, we saw that Jesus called him a fool. He was a fool because he became rich in this world, but he's not, he was not rich toward God. And that very night, his life was demanded of him. And he shows up having not prepared for the life to come, having not invested there. Everything he had was here. And Jesus says, it is foolish to live like that. And, and I want us to pick up on this text again today because what this rich man had bought into was this lie, it's all about you. It's all about you. And we get a little bit of light on this in Luke 12, verses 17 through 19, because the text there says, he thought to himself, he thought to himself. You're like, hey, if he thought to himself, how do we know what he was thinking? Because God knows your innermost thoughts. He knows your motives. He knows exactly why you do what you do. He knows what you're thinking right now at this very moment. And, and Jesus says, this man was thinking to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Nine personal pronouns in three verses of Scripture proves that he was only thinking of himself. His entire outlook on life was, was the result of buying into this lie. It's all about me. It's all about my comfort. It's all about my ease. It's all about my fulfillment, my pleasure, my life. It's all about me. And the question I want to ask today is, is that true? Is it, is it all about you? Is that true? I, I want you to imagine today I want you to imagine that over here to your right, there is a door. In fact, you can see it over there in the corner. There's a door right there, a single door. I want you to imagine that if you go through that door right there, you will be blessed. That is the blessed door. You go in that door, you will be blessed. How many of you would like to go through the door? Just out of curiosity, how many? Around the room, okay. That's okay. It's not a trick question. Would you like to be blessed? Go through that door. You're like, I don't know. What's, what's behind the door? I don't know. Go ahead. Go find out. Go ahead. Go see. Um, yeah, that's the blessed door. And if you go through that door, you will be blessed. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that over here on this side of the room is the double doors. That means if you go through those doors, you are more blessed, double blessed. You get double blessed if you go through that door right there. It is double blessing if you go through that door. So you've got the blessed door. This is door number one, the blessed door. And over here we have door number two is the more blessed door. Blessed, more blessed. So on the count of three, I want you to point to which door you would like to go through. You ready? Here we go. Not a trick question. One, two, three. Yeah, yeah, everyone, right? Because you want to be, who wouldn't want to go through the more blessed door? We want to do that. We want to be more blessed. We want, to be, we want the double wide blessing right there through the, the double doors. I, I get that. That's, that's important. And you know, as Christians, you can go through both. I mean, if you are a believer in Jesus, you're already blessed. You are already blessed. You're blessed in so many ways. You're already blessed. But you can also be more blessed. You get to pick. Well, if you're interested in being more blessed, I want you to listen to these words of Jesus as, as uh, recalled by the Apostle Paul. It's in Acts chapter 20. It's in verses 33 to 35. I have it up here on the screen, and here's the text. Paul says this, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In other words, I, even though I was serving you, you didn't have to pay me. I earned my own money and I served among you. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the very words of the Lord Jesus himself. So Paul says, here's what Jesus said. In fact, why don't you read it out loud with me. It is more blessed to give than to receive. You are more blessed if you give 
than if you receive. So when you receive, it is blessed. It is a blessing. When you receive, it is a blessing. You will be blessed to receive. But the words of Jesus was, it is more blessed, it is double wide blessing to give than to receive. How many of you still want to go through door number two? Because you're like, that was a trick. I thought I wanted to be more blessed, but now that you put it that way, maybe I just want to be blessed. Why would you say that? Because you've bought into a lie. It is more blessed to receive than to give. Why would you say, no, I'm, I don't want the more blessing. I'll just, I'll just, because you actually believe it's more blessed to receive than to give, and Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's the truth. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And Paul says these are the very words of Jesus. Now, as we belong to a kingdom where our master has set an example of giving. I mean, think about this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Ephesians 4, 8. When Jesus ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. He gave us gifts through his grace. In Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In John 1.12, to all who have received him, he's given the gift of eternal life. That means if you're a believer in Jesus, if you are a Christian, you are already blessed. You've already received eternal life. You've already received gifts that God has given you. You're expressing his blessings in so many ways. But you've got to grow and mature if you want to get to doorway number two, which is where it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I really do believe there are at least two obstacles, I want to mention two this morning, that are preventing you, keeping you, hindering you from going through those doors, from experiencing more blessing. And the first obstacle is materialism, the obstacle of materialism. Materialism is just addictive. The accumulation of more, the pursuit of more, it's never satisfied. I mean, how many of you bought a digital device? It was new to you and you were so excited about it. And within months, you were like, you've got to be kidding me. They came out with a new device. It's got the updated features that you want. You're disappointed. You're like, you know, I really need that. You know, it's, it's never enough. We want more. Solomon, who's the richest man who ever lived in Ecclesiastes 5.10, he said, whoever loves money never has money enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Never. It's never enough. In fact, there was a study done by Newsweek a while back, and they asked people, what would your level of income need to be in order for you to feel personally fulfilled and satisfied? What level would it need to be? And here's what they discovered. People who made $25,000 a year, that was their income. When they asked people who made $25,000 a year on average, what would it take for you to be fulfilled and satisfied? You know what they said? It would take about 54000 When they asked somebody who made $100,000 on average, what it would take for them to be fulfilled and satisfied in life, what would it take? And they said it would take about 192000 and what they discovered from this exhaustive study is that happiness and contentment is always about twice as much as wherever you are right now. You're never satisfied. It's, not, it's a moving target. It's never quite enough. We work and we live our lives trying to get a little bit more and a little bit more, but we get there and we see it still need a little bit more. I mean, you know this to be true, right? I mean, many of you, maybe many of you are making more money right now together, maybe as a couple or whatever, than you were before, and you're going, man, it seemed like I almost had more before. What's going on? It's never quite enough. Dr. Martin Seligman, he's considered by some to be the preeminent American psychologist of our time. He was studying this issue of happiness and what makes people have a sense of well-being and contentment, and he wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. And he said, and this is kind of paraphrased, he said, most people, if you ask them, would say that happiness is just a little bit more of something else. More money, more pleasure, more success, more power, more something, just a little bit more of something that would make them happy and content. And so here's what he concludes in his book. The gap between more and enough is never bridged. The gap between more and enough is never bridged. Materialism feeds this. It says it's all about you. It's all about receiving. It's all about storing. It's all about hoarding. It's all about getting. It's all about more. That's door number one. It's about receiving. There's another obstacle that's keeping you go from the double wide door, and that is the obstacle of fear. 
It's fear. When, especially when it comes to our money. We're talking about money talks right now. And we'll conclude this series next week. But when you think about that, when you think about money, that's where we have a lot of our fears. Because we're thinking, if I give, I, I, I won't be able to pay my bills. If I give, I, I won't have enough for my future. If I give, I might miss out on something I really want. If I give, and fear becomes our biggest trap. Because it strikes at the heart of God's faithfulness and opposes our confidence in his love and his provision. And so we, fear keeps us from doing what God would want us to do. All, those of us who've, who maybe, that are, that are believers or Christians, especially those of us who have grown up in the church, we understand that God wants us to give to him first. The first of what we have, he wants us to give it to him so that he is first in our lives. This is a principle that we live by. And sometimes I'll, I'll be talking to people who are in debt, who are believers, and sometimes those who are just kind of checking things out, and, and maybe they're in financial struggles and things are tight for a myriad of reasons. Some of it uh, can be very valid reasons, emergencies and health issues, all kinds of stuff. And, and we'll have a discussion, and a lot of times it'll come down to, they'll say, so do you, do you think that we should, until we get this debt paid off or until we get our feet under us, do you feel like you know, we should stop? you know, tithing or giving to God until that happens and then get back into it. And I have just always said in these instances that I really do believe that we will pay off our debt faster and we will fare better living off nine-tenths of our income with God's blessing than ten-tenths of our income without it. That when we give to God first, He, he seems to help us in that journey. It doesn't make it easy, but He seems to, to help us in the journey. But fear... Fear that you won't be able to, or fear, it will lead you to disbelieve that. That you are more blessed to give than to receive. Fear will lead you to disbelieve that that's true. In fact, I think that's why right here in Luke chapter 12, I know last week we already talked about worry and some stuff like that, but later on in Luke 12, of the same story about the rich man, in verses 32 to 34, Jesus addresses this. And here's what he says. He says, Do not be afraid, little flock, For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. Some of you ladies got excited for a moment. Provide, yeah, purses. Oh, that won't wear out? A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Jesus is not saying sell all your possessions and give it all away to the poor because at that point you wouldn't have anything else to give. You'd have to receive from then on for the rest of your life, which isn't what he's saying. He's saying leverage what you have, find ways to give because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now there was a rich man one time that he said you need to give everything to the poor because uh, you you love money too much. But we, we, we should give and that way we invest in the kingdom. But we don't believe that. We're not sure it's more blessed to give. But he's saying find ways. If you give to others, you'll invest in a a heavenly economy. When you give, when when there's a need, you're investing into a kingdom that will never run dry. The resources will never run out. No one can ever take it away. It'll never spoil or fade. Invest in God's economy. And you'll be more blessed. When we give to God, when we give to His kingdom purposes, this is what happens. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. When we get our eyes off of what we want and what we desire and more in ourselves and we fix our eyes on God, our helper, we can have confidence that he's going to provide us with what we need. And fear may be the greatest obstacle to keep that from happening because when we are afraid, we fix our eyes on circumstances. We fix our eyes on the here and now. We don't look to God at all. We need to get our eyes off ourselves and onto the helper, onto our God. And there's so many scriptures that reinforce that idea that when we give to him, we're more blessed. Like Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine. And what he's saying is there is a direct correlation between your giving and your receiving. And that is why it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Husbands, are you a doorway one kind of guy? When you come home from work, everybody goes into hiding, the dogs run for cover. 
feed me, help me, give quiet, peace, or are you a doorway to kind of guy? Giving a listening ear, encouraging, helping, supporting, investing. Wives, doorway, doorway number one, kind of gal or doorway number two. After a pretty big day, say, you know what? I gave all day. I'm giving out right now. Doorway number two doesn't always sap your energy. In fact, sometimes you gain energy when you give. It's more blessed to give. You find reserves of energy that come just by giving. Are there any exercise people in the room? Like to exercise? Any exercise people? Want to be honest? Nope. Nobody. Nobody <laughs> likes exercise. Yeah, there are, there's a few. Okay. They were just afraid I was going to call them up here, which I am. Would you come on up here and show it? No, I'm just kidding. Any Zumba instructors out here? What, what would they tell you? When you come home after a you know, pretty long day of work, and you come home and you're a little bit tired, what gives you more energy? To sit on the couch and eat a donut? Is that energizing to you? They'd say, nope. Go walk a mile. Get, the, get your blood flow. Get, you, you may be roofing. You may be using your muscles all day, but you're not getting your heart and lungs going. But you walk a mile, and you start getting oxygen in your blood, and you start getting a little bit of exercise in your body. All of a sudden, you know what? You feel better. But you don't believe that because you're sitting on a couch eating your donut. That's why you don't believe that. But it is more blessed to give you know, than to receive. Even extra studies show it to be true. I don't know if any of our kids are with us today. Most of them are in in Crave today or over there in Grow. Are they a doorway one or are they a doorway two? Okay, they're teenagers, obviously, right, doorway one, but maybe not. My clothes aren't washed. Where's my tennis shoes? You want me to clean my room right now? You want me to clean? Yes, I do. Because if you're not a contributor, then you're buying into a lie. It's, it's, It's all about you. It's not all about you. The truth is, it's not about you. It's all about God. It is not about you. It's all about God. Which is why when you look at giving throughout the Bible, you see it all the way through the Old and New Testaments. It's not an Old Testament idea. It's it's God's idea. And when you begin to think it's all about you, you'll begin to take what is not yours. Every resource you have that you've received, it's come from God. He's the owner of it all. And you'll start to take what's not yours. I I want you to imagine for a moment that you have an uncle, a very rich uncle. And he comes to you and says, I want to do something for you. Okay. I want to give you $10,000 a month for the rest of your life. How many of you find that to be a pretty sweet deal? Yeah, it'd be a pretty sweet deal. He says, but I also, I want to ask that um, when you receive those funds, I'd like for you to take $1,000 of that, and I want you to invest that into another account that I have. And uh, if you will do that, that will accomplish some other goals I have. But this is something I want to do for you. And I mean, you are blown away. You can't believe it. This is unreal. you got to be kidding me. So every every month, sure enough, you you get a check, $10,000. You willingly, with gratitude, with excitement, write a check for $1,000 and put it into his other account. But you know what? After about 10 years, I mean, the, the cost of living goes up. Expenses go up, the, uh, the, the pressure, stress go up, and you get to this month, and, and you're in this month where you're just like, you know, I, I, I don't have $1,000 to give. And so you, you, don't, you just skip that month. You know, I'm going to skip a month, but then the next month comes, and you don't have $1,000 either, that month either, so you've got to skip that month. And your uncle comes back to you and says, hey, I know the last two months we don't have any investments going in, into our account here in our fund. What, what happened? You're like, man, I, I mean, stuff you know, expenses went up, and I, I just didn't have it. I didn't have it this month. Like, what do you mean I didn't have it? I gave you $10,000. I know, but I, with everything else, I, I couldn't pull it off. He's like, no, no, you, you, didn't need to, you need to give $1,000 in that account. I'm going to give you $10,000. You put that in the account. And you say, well, I just can't. He's like, no, that's my money. He's like, no, no, it's my money. I can't do that. If you were the uncle, what would you do? So this is the situation that the people of Israel were in, it's Malachi discussing it, talking about it. And in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, he says to them, you are taking from God what is His. 
And he says in verse 8, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And here's his answer, in tithes and offerings. God had called them and commanded them to give to him first. And they, they just weren't doing it. Even though everything they had was from him, they didn't do it. And so God goes on in Malachi 3.10 to say, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Now, what's pretty stunning about that text is that throughout the Bible, there's other places where God is testing us. Even David would say, search me and know me, test me, see if there's any impure way in me, test me, God. So you have a place in Scripture where it's like, test me, but in this one spot, God's like, hey, test me. I want you to test me. You give to me. You give to me first. You make me the first in your life and see, see what I will do for you. See what can happen in your life. See if I won't bless you in a big way. Now look, tithing doesn't earn you anything. We don't do it just so we can get. That's not the point. But we do miss blessings when we do not make God first in our finances. When we fail to trust God with our resources, we miss out on blessings. In fact, what's interesting is in in chapter 3, 8 through 10 of Malachi, the nation of Israel was under a curse Because they failed to give a tenth back to God. They bought into the lie. It's all about you. It's all about what you have. And and they bought into this lie. No, it's all about God. It's all about God. This is why God wants us to give to him. In Deuteronomy 14, 23, it says, Set aside a tenth so you may learn to revere the Lord. Because by giving to God, you declare, it's not about you. It's about him. You set aside a tenth to revere the Lord. Anytime you do that, you're showing honor to him that he is first. You, you give him a tenth, a tenth and then it, you test him to see his faithfulness and how it comes through for you. And I don't know what that's going to look like for you. Maybe God would keep you from losing an account. Maybe you wouldn't be passed over for a promotion. Maybe. Maybe as a waitress, you, fewer people short you on tips. Maybe you'll find more favor, you're a teacher, maybe you find more favor among the parents of your students. That'd be nice. Maybe you're, you have a vehicle that just, it doesn't quit, it just keeps going and going. And, and uh, man, it's, it's, it's blessing you in a big way. I don't know what it's going to look like, but here's what God says in Malachi 3.12. If you do this, here's what he says, then God says this, then all nations will call you what? What's it say? Blessed. In other words, they will look at you and they will see that you are more blessed. And they will take note of that. It becomes a testimony to your God of his provision for you and how he's taking care of you. And they're like, hey, what's going on here? What's the secret here? What's the difference here? And you get to give testimony to God. It's because of my God. It's because of his blessings in my life. I just trust him with it. I give it to him. He blesses me in some way. And and what we discover here is that the real issue is not about giving 10%. The real issue is about managing the entire 100%. It all belongs to him. He is God. He is Lord. How are we going to manage this to honor him? There was some research that was done here a little bit uh, a while back in in which it said that 8% of evangelical Christians tithe. Only 8%. And in this book by Ron Sider called The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, he concluded in his research, he said, if if, if American Christians simply gave a tithe, there would be enough private Christian dollars to provide basic health care and education to all the poor of the earth, and we would still have an extra 60 to 70 billion left over for evangelism around the world. That's what his research came up with. In essence, saying it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. Now, who said that? Who came up with that? The very words of Jesus. Jesus did. He is our example to follow. He set us an example of giving. And as we go into a time of communion where we see the greatest gift of all, I, I, I'm going to read a scripture to you. And before I read this, I'm going to ask that our servers would go ahead and be dismissed for this time of communion that's coming. But in Romans 8, 32 and in verse 34, here's what we read about our God. Here's what we read about Jesus. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. 
How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life. Is at the right hand of God interceding for us. In other words, God is so generous and so gracious, he gives us Jesus, who gives his life on the cross for us, and even today is interceding for us. When Satan accuses us, when he points fingers at us, when he condemns us, Jesus is there in our defense, interceding on our behalf, our mediator, who's already paid the price for our sin. He's standing there. We're clothed in him. We're holy in him. We had two today that were baptized into Jesus. Galatians says, when you're baptized into Christ, you're, you put on Jesus. You're clothed with him. That's how we stand right there before God, clothed in Jesus. That's what he's done for us. And if he will do that for us, then, then during a time of communion like this, when we take bread representing his body and a cup representing his blood, how can we not see that we have the most generous God in the universe? And because of that, how can we not say, God, it's not about me. It's all about you. I give it all to you, God. And so, Jesus, during this time of communion, as we remember your death, your sacrifice, the payment of sin for our sins, Lord, we are grateful. You're a good God who's given good gifts to men, and the greatest gift of eternal life is found in you. We remember that right now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.